Hello everyone. In today's video I will share with you 14 things that are either not well explained, less than obvious, or often overlooked by players in this game. Veterans will likely know most, if not all of these, but hopefully new players will learn something new, that will help them build a bigger, better, nicer looking republic. So, without further ado, let's get started. Number 1. How to keep important buildings staffed. My personal rule of thumb is that industries with lots of workers can be managed by infrequent, but high capacity routes. On the other hand, if the building has only a handful of slots that can be filled, the turnover needs to be quicker to keep it operating at peak performance. You'll notice that even though workers arrive at this oil refinery in big groups, all starting their shifts at the same time, the active number of workers get reduced gradually. For a factory employing a lot of people this means there can be a bit of delay between the arrival of big groups. But a smaller employer, like this gas power plant, loses its workforce over time too. A more frequent turnover is required in this case to avoid having no workers, and power getting shut off. The most popular solution to this used to be cable cars. But we have a better option these days. Number 2. You can tell road vehicles to space themselves out on their routes. Since the introduction of this feature, road vehicles can be forced to keep equal distance between one another along their routes, so they arrive at their stops at regular intervals, instead of randomly bunched together. To gain access to this, you need to make sure that none of the stops are designated to wait for full load or unload. If one of the vehicles gets stopped for some reason, like a rail crossing, the other ones behind it will slow down, until equal distance is achieved again. Cable cars are dependent upon power, while road vehicles only need fuel. Even if power gets shut off, it is very likely that most of these buses will have enough gas in them to reach their destination, restarting production. If power goes out, any worker on the cable cars are stuck there, and nobody can make it to the power plant. But with frequent arrivals, it is highly unlikely that this would ever happen. Still, better safe than sorry. Number 3. Quick buying resources have an extra delivery cost attached to them. Let's say you want to build a new apartment block. It is the cheapest right next to the border, and it gets more expensive as you try to build further into the heart of your republic. This applies to every single product that you quick buy. Food in your grocery stores, alcohol in your pubs, chemicals in your fabric manufactory, etc. Even if you don't produce something domestically, you can still set up a delivery route from a customs house to your buildings. Once you start producing fuel yourself, you can pretty much completely eliminate this extra cost, by buying at the border and delivering the goods to its destination yourself. Of course the end goal is to be entirely self-sufficient, but until that point, there will always be some materials that you have to buy, so might as well minimize the cost. Number 4. You cannot store concrete or asphalt. I saw people get tripped up by this a couple times. In real life, these two resources need to be used fairly soon after they are made, since they will harden after a little while. That is why concrete is transported in cement mixer trucks, and asphalt on heated truck beds, so they don't solidify before they can be used. The game simulates this by not having any way of storing them. They have to be picked up straight from the production plants, and transported to their destination. There is no time limit or anything, but because they are a time-sensitive resource in real life, there is no storage available for them in the game. Just make sure that the production facilities are well stocked and staffed, so whenever the need arises, you'll have them at the ready to make fresh truckloads of the materials. Number 5. Football fields and tennis courts are closed during winter. If you play with seasons enabled, you will find that citizens cannot satisfy their need for sports after snow falls, if they only have access to football fields or tennis courts. The alternative is to build an indoor pool. Apart from working all year round, they have more than one staff slots too, so there are no interruptions when the last worker's shift is over and another is yet to arrive. They are more expensive, but much more efficient too. Number 6. Don't underestimate the usefulness of the overlays. They can show you where resources are in your republic. You can see them being transported on the roads, being produced in factories, you can even tell where they are imported by looking for the ruble or dollar symbols. You can also check where certain citizen requirements are not met, and even allows you to check on the health of your power infrastructure, making sure everything gets power and heated. Number 7. Terrain overlays are more useful than they seem. One of my favorite things in this game is the freeform nature of its building system. You can put anything anywhere at any angle, making everything as orderly or as chaotic as you please. 
but I keep seeing people asking how to put things on a grid, so they are neat and orderly. If you press this button or F1 on your keyboard, a wireframe grid will appear on the ground, allowing you to use it as a handy measuring tool when placing buildings. Personally, I like to use the green boxes that indicate the building's footprint as a marker, placing them right on the corners of the grids, and working from there. Making roads adhere to this grid is equally as easy. Simply follow the grid, and you'll have neatly arranged streets in no time. Sometimes it can be a bit finicky, because a neatly laid down road doesn't want to make a proper 90 degree connection to another road. In that case, simply delete the other road segment, rebuild it in a way that places a node right where you want the two streets to connect, and they will be able to connect there, no problem. The other one is the topographic overlay, which can be activated by this button, or by pressing F2 on your keyboard. While the grid shows the relative elevation change by coloring the squares from white, to yellow, to red, topographic view is much easier to interpret. A general rule of thumb, if you want to cut straight through those contour lines with a road, anything beyond yellow is almost guaranteed to be unbuildable. To conquer those red lines, run close to parallel to them, making slight elevation changes as you go along the mountainside. Just like in real life you don't see roads shooting straight up the side of a mountain, you also have to make incremental progress towards reaching the top or the bottom of a particularly steep incline. As you can see here, I start by dragging the road along the same line for a bit, and then go up a couple steps. If the road is still yellow, I can hold the right mouse button to level the ground until it turns green. While this was an easy hill to climb, with a bit of terrain alteration, all mountains can be conquered. Number 8. You can designate named areas yourself. One of the less than obvious features this game has. Whenever you build in a new area, you might see random names appear, and while you can change the text, changing the position isn't as obvious. To do so, open the Terrain Tools menu in the Building Toolbar, and look for the icon with the N and the underscore on it. This allows you to place new area labels at your leisure. To move a name tag, create a new one where you want it to be, only then can you delete old labels. This is because buildings get their names from the area they are in, so if there is a structure in an area, it cannot be deleted before replacing it with another. Also, when building infrastructure in the middle of nowhere, the game sometimes creates a new area name, even though no actual buildings are present that would require it. In that case you can safely delete them once the road, train tracks or power poles finish building. Number 9. Train signals also act as waypoints. When you are setting up a new train route, and want to ensure that they take a certain path, for example to avoid heavy traffic areas, then you can use train signals as waypoints. They will make sure to include those signals in their routes, and avoid getting held up by queuing passenger trains. Number 10. Dirt roads are free, and built instantly. In this game building takes time. The resources need to arrive at the construction site, workers and machinery need to use those resources to build things except for dirt roads. Since they don't require any materials, no workers are needed to build them. Sure, vehicles and citizens that use them move incredibly slowly, and in case of pedestrians reducing walking distance drastically, but in the early game where things tend to be smaller scale anyway, they are not only cheap, but a completely free way to set up the early road layout of your republic. Over time you can upgrade them using cheap gravel, and eventually you asphalt roads. But they are useful even later on, mainly as service roads, connecting things like substations, conveyor towers or oil pumps to the main road network, so fire trucks have a way of reaching them. Number 11. Helicopters don't need workers to operate. When you build a fire station, and buy a fire truck, you will notice that new worker slots appear, and the more vehicles you have, the more firefighters need to work there. This however does not apply to helicopters. You can build a fire station in the middle of nowhere and attach a helipad to it, and when you buy or assign a helicopter to it, no new worker slots open up. This means that unlike fire trucks, helicopters only need fuel, electricity, and a nearby river or lake, to operate. Very useful for remote operations where workers are otherwise unnecessary, like oil pumps. They are more expensive, but have a faster response time, they extinguish fires faster, and are not tied to roads. Take this tip under the advisement, that this might change in the future, should the developers decide that this isn't how it should work. Number 12. You can label your buildings with banner letters. Another one of those, less than obvious features in the game. 
If you want to label your buildings, you can do so by pressing the icon in the buildings info window, with the T and underscore on. Whatever you type will appear on the front of the building in big red letters, letting you know what you're looking at. You can label almost anything. Train stations. Housing blocks. Industries. Even statues and monuments. Number 13. Press the T key on your keyboard to build a mirrored version of a building. When I made this video, this feature was only available in the test branch, and by the time most people watch this, it is most likely already available in the stable release. Basically, whenever you want to build something, but certain connections don't want to line up where you want them, you can press T, and the building will flip to a mirrored version of itself. When building complex industrial parks, this can help you arrange buildings the way you want them to, instead of being forced to do a certain layout by the game's predetermined building orientations. Number 14. Press the N key, to quickly get rid of fresh dirt. This is just a quick one to finish things. Whenever you build or bulldoze something, large brown patches of dirt are left behind around the area. To quickly get rid of it, you can press the N key on your keyboard a couple times, and that will gradually fade it back into grass. If you deleted something like a road, sometimes the packed dirt is still visible even after the fresh mud dries out. To get rid of that, you can use the Restore Soil option in the landscaping tools. This will completely rejuvenate the grass, as if nothing was ever built there. Just try not to use it too much around existing infrastructure. It can lead to some interesting graphical quirkiness. And with that, we are at the end of my list of things, that hopefully helped you in some way. This was the first time I tried to include some text in a video, and I can only hope it was helpful in getting some of my points across, and that they weren't too distracting. As usual, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, leaving a like and subscribing to the channel just might motivate me to make more. Thanks again, and have a great day!